the moguls the moguls were descendants of the two great lineages of rulers from their mother's side they were descendants of chungis khan and from their father's side they were successors of timur lang however moguls did not like to be called mongols as they were proud of their timurid ancestry babur babur inherited the small central asian kingdom of fargana at the young age of 11 years soon he was driven out by an uzbek tribe of the region his attempts at the conquest of samarkand had failed he soon conquered kabul in 1504 ce babur was fascinated with india's wealth when daulat khan lodi invited him to india he did not want to miss the opportunity of conquering india he then invaded india and defeated ibrahim lodi at the battle of panipat in 1526 ce after this babur occupied delhi and made agra his capital This battle marked the beginning of Mughal Empire. Babur defeated the combined forces of Rana Sanga of Mewar and his allies at Khanwa in 1527. Later, he conquered Gwalior, Dholpur and other places. He defeated the chief of Chanderi in 1528 and Afghan chiefs of Bengal and Bihar in 1529. In a short period of 4 years, Babur acquired territories from Indus to Bihar and from Himalayas to Gwalior. But before he could strengthen his hold over his conquest, he died in 1530. Though he was buried in Agra, but as per his will, his remains were later moved to Kabul. Babur was most illustrious man of his age. He was educated in Persian and Arabic and wrote his autobiography Babur Nama. In Turkish, his mother tongue. We learn about the Mughals from a number of books written during this period. We have Jahangir's biography, Jahangir Nama, written by his sister Gulbadan Begum. Many court historians like Abul Fazl, travelers like Frenchman Bernier, and Christian missionaries like Father Rudolf have left behind very valuable accounts. Humayun, after the death of Babur, his son Humayun succeeded him. and inherited a large empire humayun had a very turbulent life as ruler initially he struggled to maintain his kingdom as he fought sher shah suri of bihar and bahadur shah of gujarat after he was defeated by sher shah at chosa and kanauj he became a king without kingdom wandering in sindh rajasthan and persia looking for shelter and help he made preparations to recover the lost territories in india by making kabul his base when he was at amar kot in sindh his wife gave birth to their son akbar in 1555 he reoccupied delhi and reestablished his empire in india unfortunately he did not live long after this he died in 1556 ce due to an accidental fall from the stairs of his library building in purana kila in delhi sher shah the ruler in eastern india who defeated humayun twice in the battles of chosa and kanauj was sher shah after defeating humayun he became the sultan of delhi he was the son of an afghan jagirdar from jaunpur in uttar pradesh his kingdom stretched from jhelum to brahmaputra and himalayas to narmada in a short period of 5 years sher shah improved the administration of his territories He had a large standing army and continued the practice of branding horses. He respected the cultivators and ordered that his soldiers should not cause injury to standing crops when they marched. Babur and Humayun failed to consolidate their power as they both ruled an empire that was only held together by force of arms and lacked a consolidated civil administration. But Sher Shah was an able administrator. He established a monarchical system of government. The kingdom was divided into provinces. which were further divided into a number of sarkars they were further divided into parganas or districts which were then divided into villages a village was the lowest unit of administration the parganas were under the sheikhdar who looked after the law and order and amil or munshi who was responsible for collection of revenue he himself directly supervised the administration he treated all equally and gave impartial justice an efficient spy system kept him well informed of the happenings in empire he was tolerant towards other religions he built a number of roads prominent among them are the grand trunk roads connecting lahore to multan and agra to jodhpur land revenue was the major source of income for the king revenue was assessed on the basis of the fertility of land the revenue to be paid was one third of the produce and it could be given 
either in cash or kind. Sher Shah took several measures for the welfare of the people. He built many sarais, which were safe rest houses where the merchants used to spend the nights during their journeys from one place to another. This encouraged merchants to travel extensively, which in turn led to the growth of trade. Trade also got an impetus with the introduction of a new rupee coin called rupiah. Sher Shah's history was written by Abbas Khan in 1579 CE, which gives many details of his administration. As per his account, if a theft or robbery was committed, the muqaddam had to produce the culprits or point out their places of hiding. It was done as it was believed that without the knowledge of the headman, nothing could happen in a village. It greatly helped in the trade and commerce. His brilliant career was cut short in 1545 CE when he died of a gunpowder explosion while laying siege to the fort of Kalinjar in Bundelkhand. Akbar Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar was born in 1542 CE in Amarkot when his father Humayu was in exile. He accompanied his father and mother Hamida Banu Begum to Kabul where he was left behind and his parents went off to Persia. When his father returned to India, he came with him. Prince Akbar's tutor was Mulassada, although he never learned to read and write. He enjoyed hearing others read out to him. He showed great fondness for animals and devoted a lot of time to dogs, horses, camels and pigeons. He also enjoyed painting. At the age of 13, he was appointed governor of Punjab, but he did not trouble himself much with state affairs. He occupied himself in shooting and hunting. We get valuable information about Akbar's reign from books. One of the Navratans of Akbar, Abul Fazl, wrote Akbar Nama, of which any Akbari is a part. Akbar Nama literally means History of Akbar, which is a biography of Akbar. It is the most comprehensive history of the reign of Akbar. While Akbar Nama is technically a history book, any Akbari is an administrative manual and is like a modern gazetteer. The many regulations embodied in the Ani Akbari provide information about Akbar's government, its several departments, its different ranks, etc. There was another court historian, Badoni, who was highly critical of Akbar's policies. This painting here shows Abul Fazl presenting the Akbar Nama to Akbar. Consolidation and Expansion of Empire In 1556 CE, Hemu, the chief minister and general of Ali Shah, occupied Delhi and declared himself the ruler. Akbar and his army, under the guidance of his regent Bairam Khan, met the Afghan forces on the historic battlefield of Panipat. Hemu was defeated and killed, and the Afghan power was crushed. This significant event in history is known as the Second Battle of Panipat. After winning this battle, Akbar reoccupied Delhi and Agra. Jaunpur, Ajmer, Agra and Gwalior also came under Mughal control. In 1561, Akbar conquered Malwa and defeated its king. His policy towards the Rajputs was to win them over by marriage alliances and by befriending them. He himself married the princess of Ambar, Jodabai. Except Rana Pratap of Mewar, he made alliances with Rajput states of Ambar, Bikaner, Ranthambor, Kalinjar and Jaisalmer. A battle was fought between Mughals and the forces of Mewar. The fort of Chittor was captured and the troops of Rana Pratap were defeated at the Battle of Haldi Ghati. But Mewar did not surrender to Mughal control. The Rajput policy of Akbar helped him to secure Delhi and Agra and helped him to consolidate his territories. It also helped him to enlist the services of brave Rajput rulers who were given important posts in administration. In 1578, Gujarat was conquered and its ports meant more revenue through trade. Bengal was also annexed later and its seaports encouraged trade with Southeast Asia. The rich and fertile land of Bengal brought a lot of revenue for the emperor. Akbar also conquered Kabul, Kandhar, Kashmir and Baluchistan, which increased trade between India, Persia and Central Asia. Akbar's Deccan Policy Akbar's ambition to rule over the whole Indian subcontinent and the prosperous economy of the South inspired him to venture into the Deccan. The mutual conflicts among the rulers in Deccan provided a favourable opportunity to Akbar to fulfil his dreams. Thus, the Mughal troops made their first appearance in the Deccan. Khandesh, Ahmednagar and Berar became Mughal provinces. The annexation of Gujarat 
provided the empire with additional revenue from the area's rich commercial centers, access to the Gulf of Cambay, and hence to the holy city of Mecca and Medina in Arabian Peninsula. So, Akbar's vast empire extended from Hindu Kush in the west to Brahmaputra in the east and from the Himalayas in the north to the Godavari in the south. Administration Akbar worked out an efficient system of administration as the emperor was very powerful. All powers were concentrated in his hands. His interpretation of Islamic laws led to the decline of the position of ulemas. The emperor ruled with the help of council of ministers. The prime minister was also called wazir or diwan and was the head of the revenue department. Kazi was chief justice and Mir Bakshi was in charge of military administration. Diwan e Aam was the people's court where Akbar met people. Diwan e Khas was the court for nobility and royalty where his officials and ministers could meet and discuss issues. The empire was divided into provinces or suba which were further divided and subdivided into sarkars and parganas. A pargana consisted of many villages. The suba was under a subedar who was a provincial governor. He was helped by the officers like Diwan who kept the revenue records and Bakshi who looked after the law and order situation. Army The king had his own standing army which was recruited by him. Soldiers were supplied by mansabdars which was a title in the military of Mughal Empire. He followed the practice of branding horses to avoid corruption. His artillery was well organized and he also had cavalry. An elephantry in his army, Mansabdari system was introduced in Akbar's army. Every officer was given a mansab or rank and was called a mansabdar. He had to maintain a fixed number of troops as per his rank to be supplied to the king. He was paid handsomely to take care of his expenses. A mansabdar could be transferred from one place to another. Revenue Revenue was an integral part of Akbar's administration. The main source of income for the state were land revenue, and trade raja todarmal the finance minister and one of the navratnas introduced some measures to generate more land revenue land was probably measured an average produce was calculated on the basis of previous 10 years one third of the revenue was fixed for the state in case of drought or floods land revenue was often waived off by the king trade was another source of income the main items of export were textiles spices indigo and saltpetre goods were traded with central asia southeast asia and russia portuguese also established trade centers in the west coast of india akbar encouraged internal trade through the building of roads akbar's religious policy akbar had a secular outlook and a very liberal and tolerant attitude towards other religions akbar took several steps which appealed to hindus as they were in majority among his subjects he abolished jazia which was a tax paid by non-muslims to a muslim king rajput princesses were allowed freedom of worship pilgrimage tax was abolished mansabs were given to deserving hindus like raja todarmal and raja man singh in employment no discrimination was made on the basis of religion akbar had been brought up in an atmosphere of liberal ideas he treated people of all religions faith of society equally as he believed in sulkul or peace for all he gradually realized that all religions had a number of good points he built a hall of worship called ibadat khana where he invited muslim scholars to discuss issues involving their religion however akbar was very disturbed with the narrow mindedness of his ulemas who disliked his policies and tried to control administration by supporting the groups that were against akbar soon akbar invited scholars of all religions to hold discussion with them in fact he was seeking truth through the study of various religious beliefs in 1582 ce akbar promulgated a new religious order called din ilahi most leading nobles refused to join this religious order and birbal was the only hindu who joined it as part of sulkul Akbar entered Navroz the Parsi new year stopped cow slaughter and took to vegetarianism he also got various holy books translated into persian although he never learned how to read and write but he possessed good memory to remember accurately the contents of books read to him architecture akbar built his new capital at fatehpur sikri built of red sandstone fatehpur sikri was chosen as capital as it was the birthplace of Salim Chishti a Sufi saint for whom Akbar had great respect
Some other important buildings were Panch Mahal, Rani Jodhabai's Palace, Diwan-e Khas, etc. The architecture was a mix of Indian, Central Asian, and Persian styles. The Buland Darwaza at Fatehpur Sikri was added to commemorate Akbar's victory over Gujarat. Humayun's tomb at New Delhi is another example of architecture of this period. It was enclosed in a garden and has a big gateway. Akbar's tomb at Sikandra, which was started by Akbar himself, was a huge structure without a tomb. Jahangir in 1605 Akbar was succeeded by his son Salim who took the name of Jahangir upon his accession to the throne he was liberal in his outlook like his father he was deeply interested in the welfare of his subject he valued justice highly so much that he had hung a chain of bells outside the palace those who had any grievance could tug the rope of the chains and would receive a hearing from the king his son Khosrow rebelled against him and was defeated at Lahore. Mewar had eluded Akbar, but his Rajput policies led him to subjugate Mewar. Meanwhile, Portuguese had also come to India. Jahangir had cordial relations with them and they were given trade concessions. He subdued the Afghans of Bengal, but his campaign against the Deccan states was not successful. He ended the long-standing conflict between Mewar and Mughals. His son Prince Khurram, also known as Shah Jahan, captured the fort of Kangra. But Jahangir lost Kandhar to Persians. Tuzuki Jahangiri, the autobiography of Jahangir, gives a good idea about Jahangir and its interests. It shows that he was a man of justice. He gives 12 rules of conduct to be observed by all the people. Jahangir married Noor Jahan, who was extremely beautiful and talented. Persian art and culture flourished under her influence. She and her family members had important administrative posts. Jahangir often took her advice on personal and administrative matters some historians believe that jahangir was very fond of drinking and she took most of the decisions in the court and became a co-regent however her rise to power divided the court into different groups one in her favor and the other against her this led to conflict and rivalry among the nobles which damaged mughal empire jahangir's failing health led to an open struggle of power between noor jahan and her own son Shah Jahan a number of nobles revolted against Noor Jahan Jahangir died in 1627 CE and was buried at Lahore Shah Jahan after a brief struggle for power Shah Jahan ascended the throne at Agra in 1628 he suppressed many rebellions but he failed to recover Kandhar from Persians he was able to put down the revolt of the Bundela Rajputs he got Bijapur and Golconda in the Deccan but they were not annexed and paid annual tributes he also sent his armies to balkh and barakshah in central asia shah jahan also led a campaign against portuguese and caused heavy losses to them abdul hamid lahori wrote patshanama which gives us valuable information about shah jahan's reign the paintings that illuminated his work are a treat to eyes as they capture court life wedding and other activities inayat khan's shah jahan nama is another valuable work of this period missionaries Foreign travelers and merchants who visited India during this period have left accounts of Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. The two things that Shah Jahan is known for all over the world are the famous Taj Mahal and the Peacock Throne. Taj Mahal, which is regarded as one of the seven wonders of the world, was built with white marble at Agra in memory of his wife Mumtaz Mahal. The Peacock Throne was made of gold and was studded with precious stones and was placed at Diwan-e Khas. at the red fort at delhi it was built by shah jahan when he moved his capital to delhi from agra after the death of mumtaz mahal nadir shah the persian invader carried the throne away in 1739 on his return to delhi he built shah jahan abad which is now a part of delhi shah jahan also built moti masjid in agra and jama masjid in delhi his buildings show the use of arches domes and minarets during this period a lot of marble was used instead of sandstone in the mughal dynasty there was no clear law of succession even before shah jahan died a fight broke out between his four sons namely dara shuja murad and aurangzeb in this succession of war aurangzeb emerged victorious after defeating his brothers and making his father a virtual prisoner at agra fort in 1657 shah jahan fell ill and died aurangzeb 
Aurangzeb came to throne by defeating his brothers and imprisoning his father. He faced many difficulties in his reign of 50 years. His Deccan policy forced him to impose taxes on non-Muslims in order to mitigate his economic constraints. This tax was known as Jazia. During his long reign, his empire reached the largest size. It stretched from Kashmir in the north to Jinji in the south and from Hindu Kush in the west to Chittagong in the east. Mir Jumla, the governor of Bengal, annexed Kuch Bihar and subdued the Ahoms of Assam. However, this was for a short period of time and these places were lost to Mughals. Later, Shaista Khan, the next governor, captured Chittagong, which was a centre of Portuguese commercial activities. Chittagong was named Islamabad by the orders of the emperor. When Bijapur and Golconda fell beneath Aurangzeb's might, rebellious Hindus flogged to join Shivaji and his Maratha confederacy. Using guerrilla mode of warfare, Shivaji took control of three Bijapuri forts, formerly controlled by his father. With these victories, Shivaji assumed leadership of many independent Maratha clans. Marathas under the leadership of Shivaji captured forts belonging to both Mughals and Bijapur. Shivaji successfully drove the Mughal armies out of Deccan and was crowned Chhatrapati or King of the Maratha Confederacy in 1674. While Aurangzeb continued to send troops against him, Shivaji expanded Maratha control throughout the Deccan until his death in 1680. Aurangzeb continued to wage wars against the Marathas for a long time. After his death, new leadership arose in Marathas who soon became unified under the rule of Peshwa. Aurangzeb's Rajput policy was just the reversal of Akbar's Rajput policy. Akbar tried to befriend them through alliances, marriages and by giving them high posts in administration. But Aurangzeb had constant conflicts with Rajputs, particularly in Mewar and Marwar. Aurangzeb's imposition of heavy taxes led the Jats of Mathura and Satnamis of Punjab to rebel against Aurangzeb. Guru Tegh Bahadur, the ninth Guru of Sikhs, was executed in Delhi as he reacted to the policy of religious intolerance of Aurangzeb. At the place of his execution, now stands a Gurudwara known as Sis Ganj Gurudwara at Delhi. After this, the relationship between Sikhs and Mughals became strained. Guru Gobind Singh, the 10th Guru of Sikhs, organized the Sikhs into a Khalsa, a military group. It was free from caste and creed. After this, the Sikhs fought the Mughals till the death of Aurangzeb in 1707.